I wanted to impress upon everybody how much I thought of W.S. Holland, who was Cash's drummer. If you're a musician and you want to talk about an incredible career, <clears throat> he only had two gigs in his life. And one was with Carl Perkins, whom he left in 1960 to join Johnny Cash and play with him until he died. So there were 60 years there, just two artists. He was just friends of the Perkins brothers. They were a true rockabilly trio in the sense that they had no drummer. It was slap bass, acoustic guitar, and electric guitar. They were all brothers. And one day, and they and, and Fluke grew up with him, and he ended up he, to, for, to the day he died, he never had a drink of liquor. So, and they were big time boozers. And he just was friends with them, and he'd drive them to gigs because he thought it was fun, you know. So he was hanging around them when they were all essentially kids. And he Fluke became WS's nickname was Fluke. Fluke became the uh, the one of the first air conditioning technicians in the South. So he had a great job, you know, and he was a, and he was just running around. His wife was like, "What are you doing?" He said, "Well, somebody's got to drive them boys home, man. They can't. They're too fucked up. They can't drive, you know." So Luke would do it. So all of a sudden, they started hearing about what was going on at Sun Records with Elvis and Orbison and Cash and all that stuff. And Carl said, "You know, we need to go over there and just drop in an audition and see what happens." But oh, but I don't want them to think we're a bunch of stupid hillbillies, so we need to take a drummer. And they said, "W.S., you're going to be our drummer," and he didn't have any, it was like me with upright bass, he had nothing, he had no musical experience. They had just seen him tapping his, with them on the bar tables or whatever, and they thought he had time, oh, what the hell, drumming. So they found the only real drummer in Jackson, Tennessee and borrowed his drum set. It was like Kevin Smith was, he was like, well, why don't you take me? And they're going, no, no, we gotta take our buddy, you know, so they did that. And it's impossible to imagine nowadays, but he walked in, He's a right-handed drummer who played a left-handed kit. He rehearsed with them once, had it set up like a right-handed drummer, like it was supposed to be. Forgot how to set him up, set him up backwards in the studio. And that, was that, that day, his first experience playing in front of other people was cutting six number one singles with, it's just stuff that can't happen now. He just had a natural thing. Till the day he died, he could not count off a song or end a song correctly because he just didn't have that and didn't give a shit about it. You know, so it was like he was, you know, he played on their version of Blue Suede Shoes and Honey Don't and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. He played drums. And if you listen to the endings of those songs, you can hear how he just collapses at the end because he doesn't know what he's doing, has no clue. And there are rockabilly purists that copy every drum lick he does at the end, and they'll get the man. I copied all your stuff, and he'd go, "Well, man, I don't know what to tell you. You know, <laughs> you were on the wrong page there." But I can't exp uh, impress upon you how much I admired him, and he was just a hillbilly genius. And when we toured with Cash, we would fly into say Dallas, and we'd hub out for two or three days, and he would rent a Lincoln Town car for every two people. So we always had a car. Speaking of luxury, no bands had that, you know. And my job was to drive W.S. Holland. So I got the whole Sun record story from beginning to end, from the horse's mouth. And he was just, he straightened my ass out about a lot of stuff because he was just really practical. He was this guy who sounded like a hillbilly, but could take one of those old Chris Craft boats that had the wooden decks and restore them to perfection. And just a, a savant at a lot of stuff. And I miss it. He passed away a couple of years ago. And uh he just changed my life. He was one of the biggest influences in my life. He was something else, man. He he died when he was 84 or something like that. And what killed him really was he had never been sick in his life. And he still, at 83 or 4, whatever it was, he still insisted on hand scrubbing his swimming pool himself. And he slipped and fell and broke his arm. And as you know, like with elderly people, sometimes that starts the demise of, and that's what happened to him. He never really recovered from that. The only funny thing I can tell you about that is the first time he ever took any pain medication in his life. And he called me and said, man, I understand what you all are into with this stuff. That's pretty good shit, man. He just, and then he stopped taking it because he just didn't, you know, he was just not that guy, you know. So he had seen so much drug abuse with all the gigs he'd had that he just didn't, didn't, didn't interest him at all.